Well, hello everyone. My name is Rafael Leitão. I'm a chess grandmaster from Brazil. And uh, today I'm going to host a webinar about my favorite chess defense against the king's pawn, and it's the knight of defense. And I'm going to show you guys the best game I have ever played in this opening. And I would like to share some thoughts about this game. And uh, most importantly, I would like to share my views about chess and uh, about the, how to study openings, about uh, what to do in middle game positions. And hopefully this will enlighten you and give you some idea to improve your chess game and improve your training. And uh, this is the idea of this webinar. It's not only a webinar about the Knight of Defense or about uh, one single game, but mostly about my approach to the chess game and how I studied this game and what I think it's important. I'm, I'm seeing uh, some comments here. Uh, uh, on uh, the other my other monitor so i will be checking uh, what you guys are saying and you can make questions i'm uh, i can also answer you i'm uh, with my profile here, there also and i hope you all enjoy it uh, at some moments of the game i will uh, ask you how you would play the position and uh, what are your thoughts so it's nice if you can communicate uh, but with a, a chat, with a chat, so this will be important for us. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now, so I can uh, show you guys my game. Okay, so this game was played in 1998. I forgot to tell you guys that uh, my current FD rating is 26.19. So uh, I have been playing chess for more than 30 years now. And this game was played in 1998. I was very young at the time. Uh, I was 18 years old. And my, my FD rating was quite high for that time, 2550. And this is one of the best games I have ever played in my life. Although, as we are going to see, it was by... Uh, it was not by any chance uh, uh, free of mistakes. So, okay, the Knight of Defense, as you guys should know, uh, it starts with this. Uh, it's a variation of the Sicilian defense. And it all starts with this somewhat mysterious fifth move by Black, A6. And... Uh, this move is somewhat mysterious. Please, if anyone uh, has a, an, a, a kind of audio problem or something like that, please inform me on the chat, but I think everything is working fine, right? And so this move is somewhat mysterious, but uh, it was a, a favorite of Kasparov and also Bobby Fischer before. And the idea, well, there are a lot of ideas with this move, uh, but mainly to play with E5. And my opponent played what was Karpov's favorite move. There are a lot of possibilities for white at this moment. There's Fischer liked to play bishop c4 here. It it's somewhat uh, it's not on fashion right now, but it's also quite possible. Uh, Nigel Short liked to play this move. He played this against uh, Kasparov in their match in 1993. Uh, bishop g5 historically is the most important move in this position. It was the main line. It's the move you have to know if you if you need to study some theory. Then you obviously should start with this move because uh, theory is quite developed here and it's a quite concrete play. So you must be really aware of what you're doing in this position. Bishop e3 is also a very important move, beginning the so-called English attack, where white wants to play with f3, queen d2, long castle, and g4, and start pressing uh, black on the king side. And bishop e2 is more, uh, it's a more subtle move, more positional. That's uh, the move that uh, was favored by Anatoly Karpov, and it generally leads to 
a calmer position if this is possible in the Sicilian. Uh, so after this move, Black has a choice between playing with e6 and or playing with e5. This is a matter of taste because both moves are equal, equally uh, played and they are equally good. So uh, Kasparov liked to play with e6 and Bobby Fischer liked to play with e5. So, so there is really no, not uh, something as a, a best move in this position. It's simply a, mess, a matter of taste. I always like it to play the Nidr with e5. This was usually my favorite move. I like because uh, black gains a lot of space after this move. Of course, you must be careful because uh, the central square, especially d5, is somewhat weakened after e5. But, well, chess has developed in a way that uh, grandmasters know that this is not a very uh, uh, big problem, this d5 square. So black can play well. It, it's more important to win a tempo and also to develop pieces. So e5 is a move that I like. So knight b3. Then bishop e7, castle, and castle. So this is uh, a normal, normal development moves. And now my opponent played this cunning little move, king h1. Obviously, it's not the most natural move ever, <laughs> if we can say it. Uh, Probably moves like, especially bishop e3, are much much more natural. But uh, of course, theory has developed a lot. King h1 is also a clever move because basically, what White is doing is he plays uh, an useful move while waiting for Black to show his hand because Black has uh, uh, to to decide on uh, his development right now. So I, I must decide whether I'm going to play with my bishop to e6 or if I'm going to play with b5, especially. These are the two most common uh, developments for black in this position. So, for instance, if, black, if I go here b5 at this moment, then white's idea is try to punish me for this expansion in the form of playing a4 here. And after the natural move b4, white goes knight d5. And this is a very difficult to evaluate position. Uh, because if black takes here, which is the most natural move, queen takes d5, I'm forced to defend my rook on a8 now. And so my only move is rook a7. He goes bishop e3, bishop e6, and queen d2, for instance. So this position can be slightly unpleasant for black because my queen side is uh, somewhat weakened. So, okay, of course, nowadays with uh, computer chess and with uh, chess engines, we can more or less uh, observe that nearly everything can be played somewhat. So white's advantage is not big, but... Okay, nowadays in the openings, it's very hard to achieve an advantage. So anything that is a small plus or a small uh, pressure is enough for you to play. So th this is the idea for white with playing king h1, uh, inviting black to play the natural knight of move b5. Also, black can play here, bishop e6. This is also a natural move. And now white's idea is to play f4. And... Why white? Why white? Explain this way. Uh, to explain that, I need to explain to you that the move f4, it's not a very good move. This was once played against me by a uh, sorry, a, a Dutch international master called Bosch, and this is not a very strong move because black can play now b5 in a different situation, and my bishop is going to b7 now, and, and in this position a4 is not so strong. So. After bishop, uh, king h1, bishop e6, and now white plays f4. So now, if I play b5, white is playing f5. 
gaining space in the king side. And so I must uh, be somewhat careful. If I'm going to allow f5 or if I'm going to take here, then he plays bishop takes f4 in one go. He didn't have to make this stop over with bishop e3 and then uh, capturing on f4. So essentially white is playing uh, with a tempo up here. So this is the main idea of this king h1 move, which is a very cunning move. Uh, Black has other options too. I played against a strong Russian grandmaster uh, who had at the time 2650. I played knight c6 once. Uh, it's a little unusual in the knight of defense to develop the knight on c6, but this is also a possible move. And uh, another weird, let's say, weird move here is b6 with the idea of developing the bishop to b7. Uh, without allowing white to play a4. As we saw, b5 is a little bit dubious because of a4, so black play more restrained in this case. And this is also one of the main lines. So bishop e3, bishop b7, f3, and now, curiously, black plays b5 <laughs> at this moment. So we have this, this a slightly strange opening theory. It's also playable. Everything is more or less equal. Uh, balanced, let's say, in this variation. But I played another move here. Uh, yeah, we are going to run this webinar more or less for an hour. It's not not sure how long it will last, but more or less one hour. So black, uh, I played here knight bd7, which is not the best move in this position, I'm sure. But OK, it's also playable. My idea, of course, is to play b5 now in a safer situation, but white played now the normal move in the Sicilian, that is a4, avoiding my b5. So I have to play more restrained here, b6. I think white is slightly better in this position. I will show you guys why I think that. Let's see if you understand the main ideas of the knight of... So, he played bishop e3, I played bishop b7. And now he has to defend the, the e4 pawn, so he played f3. Now I played rook c8, which is a very normal move, but be aware that sometimes in chess, in at least in, I would say, in high-level chess, in, in games of players with, uh, let's say, 23 or 2400 and up, Sometimes natural moves are not enough. You have really to dig deeper in the position. Otherwise, even by playing natural moves, you might run into trouble. So this is more or less what happened in this game because I played this, okay, it's a natural move also. But here, I think black must already be careful with this position. So, uh, well, I will ask you now, uh, how would you play with white to this position? Which moves do you think are natural? How are you going to play here? What do you think, people? How are you going to play with white here? Any ideas? Yeah, now, okay. The main uh, theme of this position goes around the control of the center, especially the d5 square. So if white managed to, to have a grip on this square, then black's position might be extremely dangerous. So white will be trying to uh, strengthen his control of this square and, and, and avoid black of counterplay. So this is the main... Uh, the main idea for white, of course, a move like queen d2 or even queen e1, as suggested, are natural. Uh, okay, they could be played, but I think white has uh, other more interesting possibilities here. So, one move that was played later, uh, two years later, I think, uh, the strong player Yakovenko played knight d2 in this position with the idea of. Uh, bringing the knight to c4. This is a very deep move. It's a very interesting move. But 
My opponent played what I think it's also a very strong move. Well, g4, I don't like this move. Is this white is not ready for that with a king on h1? So this would be a positional mistake. But uh one of one chess concept that I like for positional chess and for play in the middle game is what I call uh uh well, I, I call it in Portuguese like a mini plan. I'm not sure this word exists in English. I'm sorry. I'm not, a, of course, as you have already noticed, I'm not a native English speaker. So I don't know how can I translate if uh, I can say it a mini plan or a small plan or whatever. But basically, this consists of plans with two, three moves ahead. And this is uh, what mainly happens in the middle game. Uh, when a grandmaster is playing. So forget about these uh, early ideas, uh, the ideas that were disseminated in some books in the 70s or 60s, that a grandmaster should make a plan that will last for all the game, and this plan is con uh, consists of uh, five, six steps or something like that, because this is a complete lie. This is not, this is not something that happens. Most, uh, most plans in chess, they consist of two or three moves ahead. So, for instance, here uh, in uh, Yakovenko, as we saw, he made a plan of two moves. He wanted to improve the position of the knight on b3. So he played knight d2 followed by knight c4. Okay, this is a small plan. This is interesting. Okay. Uh, so what else can white play here? My, op my opponent played a very strong move also. He played rook f2 which I, uh, at the moment he played, this was quite surprising for me, but as I later understood, this is a plan favored by the great Effin Geller, a uh, very strong player with the white pieces in the Sicilian defense. And, okay, this is also a three-move uh, mini plan. His idea is Rook F2, followed by bishop f1 and rook d2 getting a firm grasp on the d5 square and uh, basically putting black on uh, without counterplay that's his main goal in this position so this is a very very strong uh, plan to uh, leave black without counterplay so i kept playing more or less natural moves <laughs> so this was not a good thing but uh, until I noticed the danger. So he played bishop f1. Then I played queen a8. And then he played rook d2. And I played here a, 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 a waiting move, like h6, because I knew more or less how he was going to play here. So does anyone know what is the typical... Uh, maneuver for white in this position? What do you think? Uh, another secret for middle game play is to be able to recognize patterns. So you have to be very good at pattern recognition and you only understand this, you only get better when you see a lot of games, uh, model games, and you know a lot of pawn structures and you have seen many games from different openings, then you are able to recognize patterns more quickly and then find uh, good solutions and even play blitz better. So here my opponent played a move that is a typical pattern for white in this position. So anyone has a, an, an idea here? So the secret to this position is to dominate the d5 square, as I said. So uh, here white has a, a typical maneuver to improve control of this square. Now, bishop c4 is not a, a, a possibility because there is a rook on c7. Yeah, knight e2 with the idea of playing c4 was suggested, but c4 is, is going to be undefended anyway. Any, any more ideas here? So white played a stronger move. 
knight c1 here. This is a really deep move. Uh, well, this is a typical move. This idea well, has been played by Karpov before. Also, he wants to play knight a2, knight b4, and land this horse on d5, uh, where I would be in uh, real trouble if this happens. Okay, so here I had to put on the red lights and start thinking very carefully what, sh what I should do here. Uh, one of the advices I had from the great late Mark Dvoretsky when I uh, went to train with him in uh, uh, Moscow is that you have to be very careful when you see that the trend of the game is going badly for you. So... Uh, you cannot sit and wait passively in a situation where normal moves are going to land you into trouble. Uh, so this is something that you must be extremely careful. So what happens in a grandmaster game, uh, it's very hard for you. This is a difference between a grandmaster. It's very hard for a grandmaster to be positionally squeezed dominated until he dies or something like that no you cannot imagine like alexei shirov being squeezed uh, squeezed positionally until he, he loses no when he feels that he is going to be squeezed he tries something he uh, brings some sharpness to the game so okay he might even lose but he's not going to be squeezed till death so that's a, a, a thing that you must understand that you you must seek to change the pattern of the game when you notice danger. So I have a suggestion here from uh, uh, one of the viewers. Uh, he is asking whether I cannot play a5 after knight a2. Yeah. Yes, actually I can, but a5 is going to weaken the b5 square. So he's going to land a knight on b5, and the other knight is going to c3, and I will be also in a positionally very difficult position due to many uh, weak light squares. So here I took a brave decision, but well, this braveness was uh, uh, helped by fear prob probably of being squeezed. So I played here, rook takes c3, a typical positional sacrifice uh, in the Sicilian defense, especially in the night earth defense. Although in this case, it's strange because I'm sacrificing and I'm not getting even a pawn for this sacrifice. But I felt this was uh, necessary. Otherwise, my position would be very dangerous. So he played b takes c3. And uh, what is my continuation now? Why do you think uh, I, I sacrificed the exchange? What, what is the continuation now? Any ideas? Yeah, that's correct. Now my plan was to make the other uh, typical knight of move, d5. So, I, uh, okay, I sacrificed an exchange, but then I open up the center. And that was my plan. Well, I thought, okay, uh, uh, I can even lose, but let's, well, let's bring some uh, emotion to this game. Let's make it fun at least. Otherwise, with a, my opponent uh, landing a knight on d5, this was not going to be any fun. Yeah, rook c8, I think it's slightly um, uh, slow because uh, I, I, I think I must uh, uh, hit the center immediately in order to make use of maybe some undeveloped pieces at the moment or something like that. Although, of course, if you turn the computer on, in this position, he will show you some strange moves and will tell you that white is better. Of course, uh, fortunately, chess is still a game played between hum humans, so you have to weight other factors besides what the computer is thinking because uh, uh, the, the computer might give uh, white an advantage at this position, but it's not easy for white to play. We are coming from a position where my opponent was played uh, by the book, as we say. He was just 
playing using his memory. He was, uh, okay, rook f2, he's, he knew this maneuver. Knight c1, he knew this maneuver, he has seen it before. So, okay, now I took him out of the book and now he must think for himself. So I changed the pattern of the game. So this is important, even though, uh, of course, you, uh, you, can f you can feel that white is still better here. So the computer, look at the variation that the computer gives here, one of the lines. So he goes knight e2, looks how, how bizarre this is. Okay, so his idea is if I, if I take on e4, he plays rook takes d7. Okay, so I go knight c5, which is a very natural move. Now the computer plays something like e takes d5, knight takes d5, and now he goes back, bishop g1, which looks uh, bad because I can play bishop g5 right now, attacking his rook, and now I am uh, gaining my exchange back. But the computer gives the exchange back and he plays a5 bishop takes d2 and queen takes d2 and he says that white is better in this position he gives back the exchange and he plays with isolated pawns and uh, he thinks he's better because he has the bishop's pair which is something quite important in most positions but come on what is the chance of a human player playing like this okay so it's impossible. No one plays a move like knight e2, gives the exchange back and play this stuff. So this is nearly impossible. My opponent played a much more normal move, but a c4. Well, this is a, a, a normal move. And now this move, this move uh, uh, gives me some options. OK, what do you think black should play now? Do you think? I should play d4, which looks like a normal move, or do I, do I play something else here? Oh, okay, Magnus Carlsen, he really could play it, but not many people, I think. Uh, bishop b4. No, bishop b4 is not a good move because white plays c takes d5. And when you play bishop takes d2, I just give your, uh, your the exchange back, but I win a pawn and the position is winning. Yeah, d4 looks very normal. I was uh, somewhat tempted to play this move. Okay, he goes back. Well, I thought about playing this position, but of course, I knew white was better. I have some compensation. The position is not lost, but I was not overly happy playing this position. I wanted to make even more fun. This is uh, funny because people who know my chess style, I'm not sure you guys have seen any game of mine uh, from the uh, later years, or if you are aware of my existence as a chess player, but I am uh, known uh, for being a positional player most of the time. But when you, I think when you are 18 years old, usually you are afraid of nothing. That, at least that's what I felt. So I usually played sharper chess at this moment. So I like it to gambit. Uh, and then later in later years, I, I, I developed a more uh, positional style of play. So in this game, I decided to keep sacrificing. So I played d takes e4, sacrificing now even more things. So because now I will be a uh, piece down after rook takes d7, knight takes d7, queen takes d7, and now e takes f3. So uh, now I am uh, a piece down. Of course, he cannot take on e7 because I play f takes g2. Uh, the position is sharp. Uh, of course, we can still feel that white is better, that the compensation is not all that strong. Uh, so, uh, uh, but the position is somewhat complicated. My opponent is a strong international master. 
I think in 1998, those ratings that you see here were stronger than they are today. Uh, you must be aware of the question of inflation in chess ratings. So there are probably, I don't know, 50 rating points more or something like that. And he is quite a strong player. He has beaten 2,700 players. I have seen it. So he played quite well at this position because uh, I had some tricks waiting for him if he played like a natural move like g takes f3, which would be bad. Bishop takes f3, king g1. And now black has a very strong move in this position. Anyone uh, wants to try? to, to or? Uh, what do you think is the best move for black here? Uh, well, I'm going to call you AD, okay? I hope you don't mind that. Uh, yeah, I have a, a, an English website too, although it's not very uh, as updated as my, my Portuguese website. And he makes a very interesting question, how many moves I had, I calculate. This was mostly played by intuition, this game. So I didn't calculate so much. Actually, I believe that in chess, you don't have to calculate as, as many moves ahead as most people think, as long as you calculate a few moves ahead, but accurately, accurately and also you evaluate accurately the position. So my, most of my calculations were three, four moves ahead. So... Well, bishop h1 threatens nothing, so you cannot play this move. I simply take the bishop on e7. So the correct move here is queen e4. This is sometimes a difficult move to see because it's a sort of a long move. Some players have trouble finding this kind of move. Uh, they might not be so easy in the eye. But this is a very strong move. Now I prepare. I threaten the bishop. I threaten uh, to bring my queen to the game. So... A possible continuation might be queen d2, let's say. I mean, rook d8, for instance. Let's say he plays something like knight d3. And now I just bring my rook to play rook d6, followed by rook g6 and uh, checkmate. Yeah, Jose, my rating was 2550 at that time. I was 18 years old at that moment. So. Uh, he played uh, uh, better here. So I'm not going to compare myself with Mi Mikhail Tao. Of course, I'm not crazy to this point, at least. But uh, what I'm, I'm going to say is that it was common in Tao's games that he made some incorrect sacrifices, but he posed uh, difficult problems for their opponents to solve. Uh, and that's the nature of chess. You have to keep posing problems for your opponent. So here, a lesser opponent might have fallen ar already into this trick. And after queen e4, my position would be winning. Uh, okay, another natural move is queen h3. So that after f takes g2, he can play bishop takes g2. But here I have excellent compensation, to say the least, after a move like rook c8, because... Uh, well, his pawns are falling like apples from the trees. And <laughs> it's not very... Uh, I, I might even uh, end up taking these three pawns. So uh, uh, my position would be really pleasant here. He played much better than that. He played king g1, offering me the g2 pawn, which I accepted, by the way, because I don't have much to do apart from that. And now... He played bishop e2. Uh, and okay, now this is a completely strange position, okay? Because my opponent is a, uh, he has a knight up, but I have how many pawns? I have lost count, three pawns. And his uh, pawn structure is shattered. He has doubled pawns, he has weak pawns. But okay. Uh, a, a curiosity, how do you guys evaluate this position? Who do you think is better? Let's make this a small exercise. You don't need to calculate much. I just want you to give me uh, an assessment. Who do you think is better? White is better, black is better. What do you think?
Well, so AD thinks black is better. Uh, I'm not sure about it. The computer, the computer pr prefers white here. Okay. Yeah, Sarvar, I, 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 I agree. Uh, that maybe it's it looks easier to play with black here. Because, okay, at least black has a lot of practical chances. Let's put it that way. Although, as I said, the cold-blooded computer says that white is better. I was really not sure about it uh, during the game. And I, I think that evaluating positions that are imbalanced, be it uh, material imbalance or any sort of imbalance, this, this kind of position are very hard to evaluate. Uh, but okay, I, I knew that I had practical chances here, although, as I said, the computer prefers uh, white in this position. So I played bishop f6 here. I'm not sure this is the best move. And some someone mentioned here on the chat that maybe my opponent was afraid because he had a lesser rating than me. And you see that the psycho psych psychology plays a large role in a chess game, of course, because chess is played mostly in our minds. We cannot express ourselves physically during a game. So we see some ghosts sometimes or uh, things like that. And when, you're op when uh, your opponent notices or he feels that you are afraid of him, he, he starts to play better or he plays with more confidence. This is going to in a small part, play a role in this game. Because my opponent here played queen g4. I don't think this is the best move. The computer likes rook b1 here. And this... Well, this is a very natural move, to be honest. Uh, I'm, I don't remember really what was my idea after this move, but... I mean, bishop f3 looks like a natural move to exchange pieces and uh, bring my pieces to bring my queen to the game. The computer says bishop takes b6 or something like that. Uh, as I said, uh, 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 during the game, you might be scared a little bit of, I don't know, bishop takes e2 and then queen e4, or queen f3 or something like that. But the computer says everything is okay and he, he thinks white is better. Who am I to disagree with a machine? But I think the position is not so easy to play. My opponent played queen g4. Then here uh, we are going to have this small uh, psychology, uh, uh, I mean, problem, This what is going to happen in the next moves, because white is threatening to play bishop takes h6 at this moment. Uh, so this is a strong uh, threat. So I played bishop e7. Of course, he cannot play bishop takes h6 now. So José is asking me how do I deal with psychologi psychological factors when playing against stronger opponents. Well, this is difficult. I, I have been winning against 27-something players and uh, didn't manage to win mostly to due to psychology, some kind of psychology. So this is very hard. But as you grow more experienced, you start to solve these problems. You start to get used to beating these players. So uh, then it's more natural. But you must trust yourself. You have to be confident. Confidence is everything in chess. I remember I, I attended uh, a lecture by Judith Poger in a tournament that uh, I was playing. This was in Venezuela a few years ago. And she said that the most important uh, trait of personality for a chess player is confidence. And I completely agree with her. A chess player with confidence, he is dangerous because uh, his opponent noticed that he's playing to beat him. So it's much more unpleasant to play against these kind of players. So Kiran is asking, what about queen to f5? Here, I, I suppose, or before? Yeah, this is possible. This looks like a possible move, yeah? 
Well, but uh, if you play here, I can play something like bishop e4, Kieran. And you cannot take on e5 because then I play bishop f6. So, okay, this is not going to be very unpleasant for black. But okay, black, uh, white has other options. I, I, I played bishop e7 mostly because I wanted to play f5 now and start rolling my pawns. So he came back with queen d7. Okay, and now I played bishop f6 again. And he played queen g4 again. Okay, and now I played bishop e7. And now he played queen d7 again. So technically, my opponent could have uh, stop at the clocks right now, call the arbiter and uh, said, uh, told the arbiter, this is my third repetition. I claim a draw. He could have done it here if I'm not, if I'm not counting wrongly. So the position repeats three times. So this is a draw. So the process says he stops the clock. He asks for the arbiter and he says, I claim a draw. My next move is going to be queen d7. It's a threefold repetition. But luckily, he didn't do it. <laughs> so I had the chance to keep playing on this game. Of course, I had a lot of doubts whether I should play it. Because there is another uh, aspect of psychology. We, I, I, I spoke about when you play against a stronger opponent. But when you are uh, a player with a higher rating and you have to play a player with a uh, smaller rating, you also have to solve a few uh, psychological tricks because you are more or less forced to win the game in order not to lose rating points. Everybody is expecting you to win or you are you are under pressure in this kind of games. It's not like I play against another 2500 and okay, if we make a draw, it's fine. It's not, not a big deal. No, it's like I have to beat the guy. I need to do it. I, I It's necessary for my survivance. So my survival. So it's also a kind of pressure. But I managed to find a very interesting move here, which is bishop h4. And uh, okay, my opponent again, he could have played a move like rook b1. Uh, probably he would have found this move if he was really searching for a way to win this game. So that's where the psychological trick plays a part. If he was actually looking for a way to win the game, he would think of a way not to repeat moves, and then he might find this move. And as I said, the computer thinks white is better. But he was uh, a little bit obsessed with making a draw after queen g4, because now he, again, he offers me the possibility of repeating the position for the, <laughs> I, I have lost count how many times after bishop e7. But here I managed to find a very strong trick and a very strong move in this position. So I urge you to think about it. How would you guys play with black here? What do you think? It's the best move. I'll give you a couple of minutes. No, f5 loses the bishop on h4. Huh? Yeah, these three babies are rolling, but without pieces, I cannot do much, dragon. So you have to beware. No, my bishops are on the way. You are, you are. Uh, I have many pieces, so I cannot, I cannot simply leave my bishop and prize here. So I, I didn't even consider this move because I cannot really give a, a whole bishop just to make my pawns go. 
So I played the stronger move here. I played queen d8 at this position. And this is a, a very strong move because now I'm getting my babies ready to roll with f5. But of course, the question that remains is what do I have up on my sleeve after bishop takes h6? Because, okay, I, I, I just gave a pawn. And now when I played, uh, someone asked me before how long did I calculate. In order to play queen d8 here, I had to see this variation. So otherwise I could not play this move. So when I played queen d8, I had my answer ready for bishop takes h6. So this is going to be my last question in this game. Why uh, black to play and win? How do you win the game with black in this position? No, queen d4 check is not possible. White has a queen on g4. Bishop f2 check is a possible move, followed by queen f6 and taking the bishop, but this is just a bishop trade, yeah, a bishop exchange. Nothing much happens. Queen f6 is also possible, but white is going to play bishop e3 after that. So it's not a big deal also. Let's see if anyone finds my move. This is one of the best chess moves I have ever played in my life. I would say this is the second best chess move I played in my whole career because it's really it's a really pleasant move. And I was talking about pattern recognition. A grandmaster has a lot of patterns because he has seen a lot of games and thought about the game for so many times. But this pattern, I, ne I have never seen in my whole life. That's what made this move particularly appealing. It's a completely new idea. I have never seen this idea in my whole life. I have seen uh, thousands of games where white has a queen on g4 and plays a bishop takes h6 or play bishop h6. But I have never before seen uh, this threat, uh, this uh, uh, checkmate threat in G7 being answered by the way I played in this game. So this makes me particularly proud of my move because it's completely unique. So someone has written here the right answer. No, queen d4, white plays queen takes d4. So it's not a big deal. Uh, so I played, as I said, a, a very original move, g5. This is one of the most beautiful moves I have ever played because it's completely original. Uh, uh, the question about this move is that it cuts the communication of the bishop on h6 with the king and uh, with the protection of the king. And now I have uh, many threats here, like queen f6 followed my mate. And also f5. So it's a complete new theme. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Because the idea is after bishop takes f8, I actually have two moves that win now. I have f5. And if, if he plays queen takes f5, I play queen d4. Checkmate. Oh, I mean checkmate in the next move. Uh, or I can win also with queen d2. I can choose both. Because this move also wins. He cannot defend against the multiple threats. And it's a curious situation also because the bishop on h4 is in a quite unique position also. It's a strange, a strange move. So I could not find this move uh, by uh, using pattern recognition. I really have to use my imagination and uh, some concrete motives of the position in order to find this move. And so... Uh, 
black white is completely lost at this moment so dragon is asking me if i saw g5 right away no this move was uh, took me a long time to find it i i cannot unfortunately i cannot replicate my th uh, thinking process to find this move it's a little bit abstract it's like i'm 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 sure i was surely after queen d8 bishop takes h6 what happens as that you feel that white's king is in trouble or you might have a way to exploit this because he is a little bit uh, in danger. And then you try to find some crazy idea or something, and then uh, somehow you spot the move. But if you, it's not something that comes naturally. Uh, that's why chess is hard. Uh, in order to really search for this move, you have to develop this feeling, that uh, this evaluation feeling, this positional understanding that you might find a good move here because there are elements for that. And then you can really calculate and find the move. That's why uh, calculation and positional evaluation goes side by side in chess. You have to develop both. The, otherwise, you cannot calculate without having a positional understanding because we are not computers. And you cannot just have pol positional understanding and not calculate anything. So my opponent here is completely lost. So he played bishop f3 now, and I just finally rolled my babies, as you guys said, with f5. And he played bishop takes g5. Now I have many ways of winning here. I chose the safest one, I guess. I played f takes g4. Bishop takes d8, and now rook takes f3. And now he resigned. I'm threatening rook f1 mate, or bishop takes d8. So. Uh, he is just lost, lost here. So someone is asking me the computer evaluation before g5, but before bishop takes h6, or even before that. Because I think the computer thinks that white is better here. I will just I will insert a computer here just to... Uh, let's see how... Uh, here, okay. But my computer is very slow, so please... Later, you can put this on a better computer, but okay. In this weak computer, he thinks the position is more or less equal. Let's see how the game changes here. So now, queen g4. And now, look, queen g4 is probably a mistake. Queen d8. Look that the computer <laughs> has not found g5 yet. I said, this is a slightly slow computer. Now, I think he found it. Queen d8. Let's see. Bishop takes h6. And now... He finally sees my move, which is the only winning move in my the position. It's a good exercise because there is le really only one winning move in this position. Uh, so I managed to win it. Uh, okay, I will just open my webcam now so that I can uh, say goodbye for you all. I hope it's working now. Uh, okay, so you are probably watching my webcam again. I hope you enjoyed this session. I have been a long fan of the Knight of Defense, but as you saw it, it's not only the opening that uh, uh, had an importance here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my, some tips about how to play the middle game, this idea of pattern recognition, of uh, searching for a move and evaluation and all these things, typical maneuvers and so on. And uh, for you guys that enjoyed this webinar, I invite you to uh, uh, find a little bit more of my, my, of my career. You can find that on my website. And also, I invite you to... Uh, there is a, a small promotion. I, I have been a partner of the guys from iChess for a long time now, and I recorded a few courses with them. Uh, I have recorded actually three courses, one speaking about uh opening one speaking about uh how to develop your tactical middle game skills and one specifically about the night of defense and the guys made a nice bundle there uh, there is a 50 percent discount if you click on the link on the comments of this webinar so uh if you want to try it i think you will like it uh, i hope you enjoyed uh, my explanations and i also hope to talk you to you guys uh, in the next time so all the best i i, I see you later
Okay, bye bye.